and the same paint, but they're going to create a very composed picture. So that most of us in this room, if we stood in front of that picture, we're going to see the same thing. We may have slightly different interpretations, but you're going to see the same thing. This is not that different than small business marketing. All too often, small business owners, small nonprofits, you know, we're, we're doing all the things, you're wearing all the hats. And sometimes it feels like your marketing is just throw and paint at a canvas. And there's not a plan. And when it's done, it's really open to interpretation. So you might be going to a trade show and you create a brochure. And you might be sending a new sales team member out into the field and you kind of give them a, a rundown and, and then off they go and they kind of make it up as they go along. And you know, you create that lack of cohesion, which can then sometimes lead to confusion. So what we want to do is be more strategic from the beginning and really be thoughtful about how we market as small businesses and nonprofits. So does anybody remember you guys familiar with the five W's? Sometimes it came up in like an English composition class when you're storytelling. <laughs> Comes up, somebody. What, when, why, how, who, yeah, we got it. Who, who, what, when, where, why, and then how. There's an H in the five yeah. W's. <laughs> so that's what I'm gonna talk about today for small business marketing is those five W's and that H. But we're gonna start with the why. So why are your business goals? The why equals your business goals. Everything you do with marketing has to come back to what you're trying to accomplish as a business. If you don't start with your business goals, you're not going to be in alignment. So start with your business goals, start with that why. If, it's, if you're a solopreneur, sit down on a piece of paper, get those business goals down if you don't already have them, and then align your marketing with that. If you have a team, get your team together and really talk about that why. Then you have who? You have your audience. Who are they? Are they women who live in Northwest Oklahoma City who have a household income of $75,000 and above? Or are they men who live in Norman who really like football? You need to get specific about who your audience is. There's demographics and there's psychographics, and those sound like big words, but the demographics is really just where do they live, how old are they, uh, you know, just those, those kind of those easy details you can you can gather for, from some research or you probably just know from doing your business. Psychographics is just kind of a fancy word for what matters to them. What's their pain? How do you help that person? What pain do they have that you can solve? So that's your who, is really thinking about your audience. You can't be everything to everyone, so you have to decide who is the audience, even if you've got a few of them, even if you have, you know, this is our primary audience, our secondary, and then our third. Um, so we've talked about the why, we've talked about the who, let's touch on the what. The what is your key messages. It's how you talk about your company, how you talk about yourself. I'm guessing that we've all heard elevator speech, you know, we've all practiced an elevator speech. Your what, your key messages goes a little beyond your elevator speech. Uh, you want to get a little more detailed than that, uh, but it really creates the foundation for how you talk about your company. Then you have the where. Those are your communication channels. You've got all kinds of options, we all know it, right? Should you be on TikTok? Do you still need to be on Snapchat? What about Facebook? Uh, you have a company website or an organizational website most of the time. You have print materials. You have the words that come out of your mouth when you go to an event and you talk to other people. These are all communications channels for you, all of them. Um, so think through that. What makes sense for you? What's worked in the past? What hasn't worked in the past? What do you have the capacity to manage? This is not always a popular opinion among marketing professionals, but I'm of the mindset that not every business needs to be on every social media platform. You don't need to do everything your competitors are doing. You have to do what you have the capacity for. So your channels. So it's really just about being strategic about where is your audience within those channels. You know, for social media in particular, I know that's one that I get lots of questions about. Uh, there, there are some basic user demographics out there for the social media channels that will tell you what are the age ranges, um, you know, kind of what's the income, how often are people on those channels, what sort of content are they engaging with the most. Um, but you have to be realistic as a small business owner that you have limited time in the day, you have a lot of things to do. Same for nonprofit executives and, and really just employees at any level. We all know there's only so many hours in the day. So 
you want to pick the channels where you can be effective with reaching your audience without overwhelming yourself. And you also want to pick the channels that you can keep up with. If you can't keep up with a social media account, it's going to probably look worse than if you're just not there in the first place. I would rather see a small business just not be on Twitter or just not be on TikTok rather than be there, but your last post was 18 months ago. The last post was 18 months ago, just shut it down. Um, and then come back to it later if you have the capacity. So again, we've talked about the why, the who, the what, and the where. The where was your, was your channels. So the when and how, that's, that's really the, the meat of it, right? Like that's the, the hard part is the, the when do you get it done and how do you get it done. Um, and so what I do with my clients is we really just go through this whole process and then we look at what channels they currently have, what activities they're currently doing, where they might be missing something, um, and we fill in those gaps and we say, okay, the website needs an overhaul. Maybe it's a content overhaul, maybe it's a design overhaul, maybe it's both but we're gonna to commit to doing that by this date. And here's the steps we're gonna to take to get it done. So it's really just comes down to, you know, creating those action steps for yourself, um, but aligning them to your audience and your messages and, and your business goals and knowing we're gonna take these actions because that's what's really important to get us where we wanna be. Um, couple of final thoughts, uh, you know, really do spend time on the whys. Don't skim over the why. It's, it's easy to do, uh, or the who. Don't skim over the why or the who. It's really easy to do because you're just, you are, you're in that mode and you're like, I just, I need this print piece next week. Or I need to get this social media channel up. Or we need to redo our website. Really take the time, if it's you yourself or it's you and your team, spend the time on the why, spend the time on the who, and then go through the rest of the steps from there to create that plan. As I said before, don't try to be everything to everybody. It's one of the biggest mistakes I think you can make is to try to serve every audience all at the same time. You're just, it's not gonna be effective. Um, and then if there's one final thought I will leave you with for small business marketing, it is be consistent and be authentic. Those two things go a really long way in today's world. Be consistent and be authentic. So. Uh. What I know is a lot of business owners are looking at how they want to market, determining what's going to be the biggest ROI is always the question. Sure. Obviously that varies based on the industry, but when you're working with your clients, do you have maybe the top two or three meth methods of marketing that you've seen bring the best results? Sure, um, it does, as you noted, it does vary a ton. It does vary a ton. For small businesses, on social media, depending Depending on your goals, depending on your industry, uh, it's, it can be incredibly hard to track the ROI of social media. So for a lot of my clients that I work with, um, their approach is really to have a, what we call a baseline presence. So to be on social media, but they're not necessarily saying like, oh, I know I'm gonna spend this time on social media and I'm gonna be exactly be able to track that ROI. So like just to know that ROI of social media can get really challenging sometimes. Um, I think email marketing is one that's overlooked a lot for small businesses. Uh, there are some pretty easy, you know, low points of entry tools to get you to sending emails to your customers. So, and there's a lot of data out there that supports that for email marketing, even if you're not getting the opens, you're staying, your business name, your brand is staying in front of those customers more regularly. Um, so I think email marketing is a, a great one that people just sometimes really overlook as small businesses that has an ROI, but a lot of it, a lot of it really is customer to what is that business, what are their goals, and then, you know, obviously your marketing budget comes into play on some of those things as well. Any other quick questions before we turn over to Jennifer? I noticed earlier you didn't mention Facebook. Is that by, by accident or on purpose? Oh, no. I mean, Facebook's still there. It, was not a, it, was, it wasn't a purposeful oversight. Um, I was just rattling off some social channels. So, uh, you know, a lot of my clients find really good success with Facebook. As as we, as most of you probably know, every social media platform has its algorithm. It wants you to feed the algorithm. You know, Instagram just shook up the whole world because all of a sudden reels get this huge priority, and if you don't have video content, they're just not going to show your stuff to anybody anymore. Right. And so then people are scrambling and say, "Okay, I need more video content." Well, how do I get video content? 
don't overlook the video as a, as a channel too. Like it goes on different channels, but don't overlook video because it, the stats on video engagement are huge. But it does, yes, just pointing to our video. Um, the stats on video engagement can be really high for a lot of businesses, but again, it's one of those that like, you have to have, you have to know if you have the capacity to do it and do it consistently well. So yeah, Facebook was not a really huge I'd like to add something to what she's saying is also make sure that you're putting the right content yes. on the right social media channels. Yes. Because not everything that goes on Facebook should go on your LinkedIn page. So once again, make sure you, you have the ability to manage what you have with the best content for that platform. Yeah. yeah. I'm rather old school about direct mailing and farming. What's yes. That? Yes. Direct mail. So direct mail still absolutely has a place. It has a role. It's all about knowing who is your audience. What are they looking for? And then tracking what your return is. So, you know, sometimes uh, some of my clients don't always have the capacity or the or the budget for like a, a huge direct mail push. But one of the things I talk to clients about is what I call targeted direct mail. You can kind of build your own list. You can make a postcard. You can drop five of those in it, you know, so it's not a, a huge, like I'm gonna cover three zip codes with a direct mail piece in the mail, but you're still hitting people in their mailbox. The power of a handwritten note in a mailbox goes a really long way these days because think about your own mailbox and how much just, you know, you're getting the flyers and the stuff and it may be addressed to you. It might be addressed to your neighbor. It might be addressed to six occupants of your house ago. You know, you just never know. So yes, don't overlook uh, direct mail either. Question back here. So I've heard a term, funnel. Mm -hmm. what, what is that? And does that, it, doesn't that go with emailing and marketing? Yes. What yes. Is that? Great question. Were you going to talk about this? Because I don't want to tell you thunder. You're, you're talking about the same ones. Okay, you're shaking your head. Let me do that. So, okay, so funnel, and feel free to tag team on this too, Jennifer. So, funnel is it's kind of, you really just think about like a funnel that starts broad and brings people down. And so, um, sometimes you hear about sales funnels, a landing page on your website can often be referred to as a funnel. So, like, basically, you're kind of starting with casting a wide net and through your marketing copy and through phases of a process, you're narrowing that down from a really wide net to the more specific kind of targeted, like more engaged leads as is the term that might be used in sales sometimes. So uh, your, your funnel, like your marketing funnel can apply to really any of your channels and it's more about kind of the, the back end process and how you qualify the way that people have engaged. So, um, bigger companies, I mean, some small businesses do this too, but like often it's a bigger company, bigger budget thing to be able to have an analytics tool that's going to look at the way people have engaged on your website and your email and your social all at the same time. And then, you know, track like this CRM systems can, uh, there's some smaller ones that can do that too, that can kind of look at that overall picture and kind of funnel those people into this is a, this is a more, you know, timely prospect for you than this person over here who signed up for your list six months ago and hasn't done anything. <coughs> Did that help? Yeah. Okay. Very I I heard that tossed around a bit, so I wanted. Going back to the emailing, is there or are there any rules and regulations? It seems like a while ago there was you can't just be sure dumb in an email, uh -huh. and then piggybacking on that, what do you think about um, you know software agencies like Contact? Sure. Sure. How are we on time? I don't want to short Jennifer. Yeah, you've got you got three minutes. <laughs> okay. Okay. This, this is the last question and, for you. Okay, great. Um, so yes, that's an outstanding question. So yes, there are rules, but even beyond rules, there are best practices. And you gotta get both. So in email marketing, it is true that the United States, uh, big giant disclaimer, I'm not a lawyer. Um, <laughs> not a lawyer, this is not legal advice. In the United States, um, basically what governs email marketing is the Can Spam Act. Yeah. And so that says, to really boil it down to the most simplistic thing, in the United States it says that you have to give someone an option to unsubscribe and you have to honor that unsubscribe within 10 days. There is a lot more wiggle room in the legality of who you put on an email list in the US than there is in any other country. If your email list includes anyone outside of the US, there's a lot more risk, um, there's a lot more accountability, but I firmly believe that those stricter regulations are coming in the United States. I don't know when, I don't know when we're going to get there. Um, so there was the California Consumer Privacy Act uh, several years ago, and they just revised it, I think, last year a little bit. 
So that deals more with like privacy and data and less about the legality of who you can email. It's more what do you do with their data and then they have the right to be forgotten if they tell you to get rid of all their data. So, um, but the best practice is you don't want to email somebody, you don't want to put them on your email list if they haven't asked to be on your email list. I know I've had this experience, I'm guessing some of you have had this experience. You come to an event like this, you talk to somebody for five minutes, you swap cards, and the next thing you know, you're on their email marketing list. I don't advise doing that. They didn't ask to be. So I'm a huge advocate for permission-based email marketing. That's your best practice. Email marketing is a relationship. You only want to talk to people who want to talk to you. So don't, don't, don't worry about numbers of your list size as much as you're worried about the quality of those contacts. Um, one thing we see people do a lot, which I, which I like, is if, if somebody hasn't opened or engaged with your emails at all for six months, eight months, if you've ever gotten one of those emails, it's like, hey, are you still there? Do you still want to be on the list? It's okay if you unsubscribe, it won't hurt our feelings. Unsubscribes are not bad. If someone no longer finds your content valuable, get them on out the door and talk to people who, who want your content. That said, you asked about platforms and technology. There's a million of them out there. MailChimp just announced that why did I just blank on this acquiring? Yeah, Intuit's acquiring MailChimp, which is an interesting move that just got uh, announced yesterday. So MailChimp's out there is an affordable, constant contacts affordable. There's some like Active Campaign. There's Emma. I mean, there's a ton of them. Some uh, some CRMs have an email capability built in. It's all about knowing what you want to do with email and then making sure you find a platform that meets that needs. They all have pros and cons. Um, I've been working in email marketing for. I don't know, I, I can't even count how many years at this point. So there's, there's pros and cons and there's platforms of all sizes. It's about finding what fits for your business. Thank you all. Oh, thank you. Uh, at the end, we'll have time for questions and, and conversations. I love this topic. I could sit here and talk about marketing all day. It just fascinates me and ideas and little things to fine tune. And, I imagine we're not going to get into A-B testing conversation today, but uh, I, we can I, love this, I love this topic, so I'm delighted that you guys are getting some good stuff out of here. Uh, Jennifer McBrail is going to come and speak next. Uh, she's with Francis Tuttle, the director of Access, which is the incubator program. Correct. So, welcome. Thank you all so much for having me. I have to say I'm loving being back in person because I never have to tell anybody you're on mute before they start talking. So I love it. So as Chris said, I am Jennifer McGraw, I'm the Director of Access, and Access is the resource where entrepreneurs, founders, and small businesses can come connect with resources and community to turn their bold aspirations into reality. So we do that through our Free Accelerator Program, a state certified business incubator program, and our entrepreneurial ecosystem building efforts. But I'm really glad to be here today because while I coach businesses literally from solopreneurs and gig economy, you know, I want to be a DoorDash driver, all the way through high growth, high tech, got the newest piece of technology that is going to be the next um, Facebook. We see it all. But I will say that marketing is my absolute favorite subject. And Linda and I did not coordinate our <laughs> topics today. And the funny thing is, Everything she said is so highly important. It's exactly the same thing I was going to talk about. So we're going to make a very quick pivot. But I've got a handout for you because I approach this that I have four simple questions that every business, no matter what size or what your business goals are, needs to think about before they do anything. Most of what you asked in regards to questions today were in regards to the promotion piece of advertising. But when we talk about marketing, promotion is only one piece of the mix. So we're actually talking about the product that you offer, the price point that you offer it at, how you promote it, and then even the place or how you get those things to your customer. But everything when it comes to your marketing goes back to that customer. So let me see if any of you can relate to this story. You're sitting in your office, you check your email, and you have three emails wanting you to purchase some type of service, some type of goodie for your business. And then you have somebody saying, hey, come buy an ad in the yellow pages. 
Yes, they still exist. I'm going to rock. <laughs> then you see the next one, you pick up your phone, and it's the person trying to sell you the billboard on the road. Then the next thing you know is you see your friend from church walking in the door. This has never happened to anybody. Hey, my kid's soccer team. Oh. He's a sponsorship. <laughs> so does anybody have that same day with their small business? Yeah, every single business does. Please tell me to stay put. I move too much. <laughs> every single business experiences that. But for you to be effective at what you do in the promotion of your business, it comes back to what Linda talked about. You have to know who your customer is. My suggestion to every business is paint a picture. Give the picture a name. My businesses, we have avatars or customer personas, and they have names. So when we're talking, we're like, hey, would Betty like that? Hey, would XYZ like that? And it's literally, we know what that looks like, what gender they are, all those factors. We know where they are geographically. We know where they work. And then we even take that to the point that we start looking at what value systems do they have? What words do they use? What language do they speak? Because that's how I've got to communicate to them through my promotion. <laughs> what challenges? are they facing and from there that information drives every business decision that we make even things that we don't traditionally think about from a actual marketing perspective those are the things that drive our decision so now that I have my customer persona and I get a phone call from the billboard company I can then know does my customer drive are they the target audience that's actually going to see that billboard? Because <coughs> there's lots of statistics that show how many times a person will see a billboard before they forget it. But now I can actually have a conversation with the person on the other end of that phone to make sure if this is something that I should do or I shouldn't do. The same thing goes when we're approached with all the different fundraisers or organizations that come in and say, use your marketing budget to sponsor our organization. I now get the choice to start saying, okay, who's going to be in church? How many people are going to be there? Where is it going to be? Who else is going to be there? And then I can make the decision of, does my customer profile match what's going to be at that event? Now, I will say some of us, we believe inherently about some organizations, and it's okay to sponsor those and have your business promoted. But you do it knowing that there's not going to be a significant amount of return on that. So that customer persona is one of the ways, and the very first way, that you should have. You might have one, you might have three, but have those customer personas. Then the next thing that I want to talk about is, I'm going to take it to some of the just kind of free ways and some ideas to implement that customer persona in regards to marketing. The first one, I'm going to say, do not underestimate or discount your public library. Your public library has access to some databases that can make your jobs really easy. Quick question. How many of you are a business that does business primarily with other businesses? Okay, I'm going to give you some freebies right now. The Metropolitan Library System has a database that if you go out on your own right now, and try to purchase it, it's going to cost you thousands of dollars to purchase a list. If you have your library cards, you can go online from your desk computer, do it from your cell phone. Now, forgive me, I forgot to check this before I came. They just got acquired and changed their name. It's a database that used to be called Reference USA. I could take my customer persona, because even if I do business with businesses, I can have a persona of where are they located? What industry? How many employees? What's their average sales numbers? I can take that information, plug it into this database. It's going to give me a list of all the businesses that fit that criteria and give me some potential contacts with that business. How many of you would love to have that list? So, see, she can speak to it. So, use the resources that you have available. 
If you're in a different area, Pioneer Library System has some that are more consumer focused and they can give you some of those more um, psychological demographics of what your customer thinks. I mean, it can get us down to the nitty gritty of what customer, uh, what color they prefer, what fonts they prefer. Another thing I would love to encourage you to do is if you do not already have one, consider standing up a one-page website for your business. I don't care if you're like, I don't need one, you need one. A one-page website, at the very least, establishes credibility for your business. We live in a day and age where everybody pulls their phone out, even if, I'm gonna pick on Kirsten today, if I call Kirsten because we're colleagues, I'm like, hey, I've got plumbing issues. Who do you use? As soon as she tells me, I'm gonna go to Google and put it in. So stand up a one-page listing. If you are a brick and mortar business, and frankly, if you're any type of business, claim your Google listing. And consider claiming other listings if your customers use those platforms. Once again, it establishes credibility of your business. If you stand up a website and that search engine optimization or SEO is important to you, those things all play together. One minor word of caution is once you claim your Google listing, make sure you check whatever email account you associate that with and have a plan in place to respond to customer reviews. It's better to have that from the start than when a competitor or somebody gets mad at you and puts a really negative reply up and then you're scrambling to go in and try to respond to everything. So from a customer perspective, think about what you would do in your own shoes. That if you're a customer and you go through and you read reviews, because I like to do it when I'm doing like travel, I like to read hotel reviews or restaurant reviews. If a restaurant or a hotel consistently responds to every review, I'm going to naturally put more truth to how they respond to a negative review because they show that they're really caring about those things. Let me pull some of my notes here. Um, oh, a big one. Analyze your competition. You always have competition. You can learn a lot from your competition. One, sometimes your competition has way bigger marketing budgets and you can start to figure out little nuances about the customers that you're serving and things that they like when they refer to what problem do you solve or what game do you provide, sometimes your competition, especially if they're really, really big, they spend a lot of money figuring that out. Use it to your advantage. Also, knowing your competition allows you to do two things. One, it allows you to understand where they might cause a problem for you. That there's things that you need, like, okay, they're really good at that, I'm never going to be able to do that. So how can I work around that? The flip side of that's also true. You can find out where your competition struggles, and that can become a unique value proposition to you because you can do it better than them. I love to use this one. Restaurants, any service-based business, check your competition's reviews on every website that you can find. Because if you look at it and you start seeing people reply back that say, they didn't show up on time. They told me they'd be there at 2 o'clock and they didn't show that day. Or, you know, they forgot to call. I never knew they were coming. Guess what that means for your business? That means, one, your customers value timeliness. They value people showing up on time. So that means you can leverage that for your business and potentially come out and say, okay, I'm gonna market myself and advertise myself and promote myself as we are always on time and here's our guarantee that we show up on time because it's important to your customer. The next one, somebody asked about email marketing. Email marketing still works, but here's the thing if you're gonna do it. Every email cannot ask for a sale. We like to, Ever heard of the 80-20 rule? I like to refer to it as we teach the 80-20 rule, but 80% of it, 80% of your emails, relevant information that's useful for your client. It 
can be a birthday card, it can be here's what's going on in their community. Do we wait just a second? I have to send stuff that's not asking for a sell? Yes, yes, you do. Ten percent of the time, it can then be relevant information that you're hoping leads to a sell. You're still not asking for a sell. Now, do you have your contact information? Does it connect back to your website? Absolutely. You want to do that. But you're not asking for a sell. You're building a relationship. Business is more than transactional. It's relational. And then 10% of the time, that's where you can hit them with sales. You can hit them with coupons. You can hit them with special offers. But remember, email, most of the time, it's not about actually asking for a sell. And then do not forget about sales. Those in small business, that is often one of the very first areas we forget about. And without sales, we don't have a business. So we have to think about what that sales process actually looks like, who's going to do it, what claims they're going to make, and how we're going to manage that. So don't ever underestimate sales. Oh, and a big, big one, and Linda didn't talk about it, and it's one that for small businesses, it's super easy to forget about. Because we think about sales, sales, I gotta get new customers, I gotta get new customers, I gotta get new customers. Think about how you're gonna retain customers. It is every single piece of marketing research shows it is less costly to retain a customer than it is to attract a new customer. Yet retention of customers is almost never thought about, and when we do presentations like this, we often forget to talk about it. So think about how you're going to retain your customers. Think about in that sales process what information you're going to get on your customers and how you can use that for your customers. If I'm a bakery and I do wedding cakes, well naturally I have names, wedding dates, and contact information for my customer. Well can I maybe use that in future years to get, hey it's your first wedding anniversary use this coupon to redeem a special cake topper to celebrate your day. Same thing if I'm a jewelry store. Birthdays, anniversaries, special holidays. But if I have customers information, I can work on retaining my customers. And then another freebie that I have, especially because we talk a lot about social media, is once I know who my customer is, and I know that my actual customer is on a particular social media platform, producing content becomes a challenge. So a couple of recommendations, if you do not have social media and you're thinking about it, one, make sure your customer's on it and that you have a plan in place that you can manage what you're doing. Then I encourage you, calendar it out, Literally, pick a calendar and write. If we talked about the 80-20 rule, what am I going to do? What are the big important holidays in my area? Start documenting out what you're going to put up. If we went into another section, there's actually tools where you can go in and pull content and schedule it and say, I'm going to sit down for an hour and do this. Um, one that they cut back on their freemium version is Hootsuite. But you can schedule stuff, and then even like Facebook now and Instagram have internal schedulers where I can say, I'm going to sit down for two hours today, and I'm going to schedule out for a month. Now, you're asking me, okay, i got to do social media. Someone talks about video, I need video, I need all these fancy graphics. I'm not a marketer, I'm not a creative social designer. I'm going to make a recommendation of a website called canva.com. Love Canva. Other tip, if you find a piece of Canva that has a, a paid graphic, if you will pull it out and replace it with a free one, that design and that text can now be used for commercial purposes. And their terms of service allow you to use everything that you find on that website for commercial purposes. The only thing you cannot do as a business owner is use their images, put it on a t-shirt or something that you're going to turn around and sell. You can give the items away, but you cannot sell them. So I can't use, I can't use it to create my brand new t-shirt on. 
So let me make sure I've got all my notes since I flipped it the minute. Oh, one other question, thought I had is when the question was asked in regards to the cell spine. Linda talked about it in a traditional sense of the wide open funnel, where you put lots and lots and lots of leads in, and then they filter through the funnel to come out. For those of you that can do some very direct marketing, I suggest you flip the funnel. And it's like this now. And I put highly qualified leads in. So I really find those people that I know fit all of my criteria for my target customer. And then I have the way to put them through the funnel. So I put less leads in my funnel with the hopes that more of those turn into actual customers. So there's my two cents on basics of marketing. I'd be happy to entertain any questions. And Linda, I'm texting questions too. Yes, sir. Well, you asked, you mentioned earlier, I think Linda was speaking about, about the company, sure your content matches your social media platform. Yes. Well, will you either elaborate on that or tell me what? Absolutely. What, what matches with what? So one of the great things is within each social media platform, look at one, which audience you're talking to on there and what they expect. If I'm somebody that's doing business to business and I'm going to depend very heavily upon LinkedIn and maybe I'm gonna say, let's say Facebook, because we used that earlier, that those are the two social media channels that I'm going to do. The users of those platforms expect totally different content. If I'm on Facebook, I hate to say the old traditional marketing or advertising techniques of put an animal or a child in it and you're good to go. That's what I want to see on Facebook. I want to see lighthearted, funny stuff. If I'm on LinkedIn, that's not what I want to see. I want to see things that are relevant to my professional development of my business. So that's where I might consider doing a lot of blog posts or talking about industry trends. Because LinkedIn, if you do anything business to business, being an authority on LinkedIn is typically a good thing. That helps. Yeah. So what about like for like Instagram? Hopefully, is, is that even something you get into as a business? Or yeah, there's lots of businesses that actually do a lot of sales through Instagram. They have ways that you can post it up, and then in the links that can link back to sell. I guess um, it's visual. It's, it's, it's the visual cool. element. Yes. And keep in mind, there's some of these platforms that you're going to on Facebook. That's what I was going to say. Is they will also link it to where they'll cross post it, but I would make sure that even there, the content, if you have it put on Facebook and it's linked to your Instagram to post, make sure the content's really relevant. If I'm going in posting something really uh, heavy and just words, <coughs> and it doesn't have an intriguing graphic element, I don't necessarily want that on my Instagram page. So yeah. And then there's Tick, don't forget this new one. If you work to a really, really young demographic, there's the Snapchat and the TikToks. I'm still trying to figure out how the world those work. So, but don't do them all because your customer is not on every single platform. And not everyone is your target customer. And you had mentioned uh, retention, which instantly made me think that a lot of small business owners also forget to market to their existing clients as well. Uh, a lot of those tools obviously still pertain, um, but what do you see most effective marketing tools is this? The, the email newsletter? Just depends. Be, yeah. I hate to say it, but it depends, but once again, we'll take it back to the beginning of we have to know our customer. We have to know what they value most. There's some of our customers that we've used the term, just in case you don't know, we've said CRM a couple times. That's your customer relationship management tool. It can be as simple as paying. Say it. There's some people that still keep that written list that's on a legal pad. Some people use Excel files, or you can then get into what you know of as like Salesforce and some broader based pieces. Know your customer. There's some customers, especially business to business, that if you can push relevant information and timely information out to them, it's a really good thing. It's like, let me, your IT. So if you service other businesses and cybersecurity something, if we have a big news story about somebody getting hit with a ransomware attack or they're taken down, now's a great time to say, you know what, I'm going to go back to all my current customers and I'm going to say, here are five tips to 
address your cybersecurity. Or if you see a really good news story, sometimes you can actually send those out and say, hey, today I'm gonna to take 10 of my customers, I'm gonna send an email, hey, I think this is really relevant to you, I thought of it. Let me know if you have any questions. You're not doing it to make sales, you're doing it to build the relationship and credibility that you're there for them and your partner. Awesome. Any other questions? London, I can tag team, yes ma'am. So for each one of you, so um, I work for a church, so obviously that platform is a little different than your traditional business. So something that we've recently been talking about is how many times a week or how often do we email? And we use MailChimp. So typically it's twice a week, but how effective is that? Is there a better way to do that? We'll do like a Wednesday announcement email with kind of our top five, and then Fridays there's usually another email with service bulletin and a YouTube link, but I mean, you could kind of relate that to any other type of, you know, business as far as communication, but what are your thoughts on that? How could we maybe be more effective? So I'll ask two questions or make two suggestions, and Linda can throw in here. The first one is with a church that gives you a unique ability to actually yeah. see what your parishioners want. Sure. And I just... I, I would consider going back to them if it is through the formal email survey or literally having somebody at the doors of the church and ask that question, like, we want to make sure we're meeting your needs. Okay. How often would you like an email? Now, the flip side of that is you can also take a look and see what your open rates are to see if there's a difference. Right. And then Chris mentioned it earlier, I'm not going to go there. If you really want to get fancy, you might even do some testing to say this, you know, for this month, we're gonna send out two, see what the open rates are, and next month, we're gonna send out one. There's so many different pieces that go into when people are gonna read your emails, but I always lean back to, in your situation, ask. Okay, ask them. That's what I would have said too, number one, is like if you have that somewhat more captive audience, you're obviously gonna have guests that maybe aren't on your list or, you know, or, or are coming and going a bit, but um, if you've got that access to your audience, ask them. And then also keep in mind too that when you're putting out information like that, you want people to be able to get that information in multiple different places. Oh, yes. sure. So you're sending it out on email, but they also know there's a landing page on the site they can go to and they can get it. And I think that's really helpful as well. But uh, And then the other thing with email too is, is have, yours is pretty simple and straightforward. But you might also want to have a preference center. Like if you're, if let's say you grow to where you're going to send out four different, five different types of emails, mm -hmm. have a quick preference center that lets people, and then you segment your audience based on what they told you they want to receive. So you'll, it, it gets into some list segmentation. But then that way you're saying, like, what do you want from us? You know, do you want the Wednesday notes, and you want the Friday, you know, look ahead to the Sunday service, but. You don't want the, the Tuesday scripture reflection for, right. for whatever reason. You know, kind of let people self-select out. Because if you start hitting too much, you'll also see your unsubscribe rate potentially go up a little bit. And one thing I would like to add, because it made me think about it that I didn't talk about, is no matter what you choose in regards to your social media or coupons or discounts, make sure that you're tracking the results. Because without tracking those results, you don't know if it was a good use of your time and resources. And so if we do something and we're like, I'm going to spend 20 hours doing this, or I'm going to spend $1,000, if you don't track whether or not you received a result or a return on that, you might make that mistake at the end. And we all know in small business, sometimes month to month, every single penny counts. And if we can keep ourselves from making a bad mistake twice, it's a great thing to do. And even, you know, even if you think, well, oh man, how do I get into those metrics? How do I track it? Like retail, you know, type stuff, you, you train your team even to just say at checkout, oh, is this your first time in? Oh, it's great to have you. How did you hear about us? And they've just got a little checklist behind the register. They're it's like on Facebook. Oh, a friend told me about it. I mean, I think you've probably all seen those types of surveys online, but don't forget to capture it with an in-person audience too, because that's also going to give you some information. Any other questions? I know we didn't cover it all. <laughs> So you mentioned surveys. Are those an effective marketing? If it's something
anything that your audience responds to. I will say, and she might throw something at me because this is counter to a lot of traditional marketing tools. There are times where I think surveys are an appropriate way to get out in front of your customer to show that you're wanting to be responsive. So sometimes there might be surveys that we're doing that we're literally doing it because something's occurred or something we've heard something about our competition that we're going to say, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to do this to show them out in front of my customers. Flip side of that, we do have to be kind of careful in surveys because the questions can be asked in a way that gives you much different answers than's really true. And so you have to, if you do a survey, you have to then look back to who responded and if it was a true sample size of what you were hoping, the group you were hoping to survey. Because you might have six people who are really adamant. You say, okay, should we open our, should we be open till 10 o'clock at night? And I get my 25 survey response back. 20 of them are like, yep, you should be open till 10 o'clock at night. And then you go back and look, and none of those people live in your community. I've seen it happen before, though. So you really kind of have to make sure you understand what went in, because it's the, the guy go, garbage in, garbage out. You don't want that. Because you also don't want to ask a question on a survey and not be able to deliver on what your customers yep. told you they want. So if you don't want to know the answer, don't ask it. <laughs> Absolutely. Don't ask a question on the answer. Exactly. <laughs> Any other questions? How do you feel about mystery shopping? As far as having your employees go? Oh. Okay. <laughs> my personal philosophy and what I work with with my clients in our incubator is depends upon your purpose for mystery shoppers. If you're literally doing it to get a good feel for what's going on and you're doing it in essence as a reward, then I'm okay with that. If you are doing it in a punitive measure, I am not as comfortable with that because you're in essence setting your employees up to fail, and I would hope that we would work with your culture better to know how things are going on without having to do that. So there's a time and a place for that. Um, well, like for yeah. us, if I get a new employee and they're not really hanging in our business much, I may have to go visit another shop. That's and great. And they'll come back and go, wow, I didn't. That's good. Now they just look at it, okay, maybe we need to do things a little different. They like, no, that's you know, perfect. That's perfect. But I was thinking you were saying from like no. a street shopper coming in and oh, they no. come in and like they can go fill out the report because they're you know, they didn't ask if you wanted the credit card no. and they didn't ask if your receipt needed to go on your back. That I'm not. No. But they might feel different. Sorry. I have no. Awesome. Well, thank you all. Thank you. Thank we you. appreciate it.